The $1,200 Titan XP 2017 model found its way into our hands on loan from a reader, and before cranking away on the hybrid mod, we ran all the numbers and benchmarked the car just like we would for any gaming GPU on our bench. This isn't necessarily something meant for gaming, though it still carries the GeForce GTX branding and could certainly throw down some numbers in benchmarks. Today we're testing the Titan XP versus the best and worst 1080 Ti cards on the market. All tests were conducted under stock conditions. Check back tomorrow for part 2 of our hybrid mod, with part 3 airing shortly after containing the results for the Titan XP with no thermal limits. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by iFixit.com, who helped provide the toolkits necessary to mod the Titan XP into the hybrid card that will soon be unveiling on YouTube iFixit makes the ProTech Toolkit, which is $60 on their website. You can find a link in the description below. For more information, use code GAMERSNEXUS for $5 off. The Titan XP at $1,200 isn't really advertised for gaming, but that won't stop people from buying it for gaming because they want the best. That's kind of what a lot of people do in the market. And that means we're going to test it from a gaming standpoint. Now, this is something that is more suitable for something like neural net or machine learning type applications, Grant, the reader who loaned us the card, is one of those developers who works in neural net applications and so could take advantage of the extra one gigabyte of memory over something like a 1080 Ti. For gaming, it's an extra $500 potentially for minimal gain, but we will find out shortly. And uh, just to kind of throw this in there, although Nvidia doesn't market the card as a gaming device heavily, it does still contain GeForce GTX branding on it and it does have the words gaming appear a few times in its product page information on the official website. Since we don't specialize in neural networks, I took the opportunity to ask Grant how he would use the Titan XP in its more targeted application. Grant stated the following, data sizes can vary and the GPU limits are based on data size and the applied algorithm. A simple linear regression can be done easily on most GPUs, but when it comes to convolutional neural networks, the amount of math is huge. I have a 4 gig data set that cannot run its CNN on the 1080 Ti, but it can do it on the Titan X. Also for us, CUDA cores matter a lot, and the good machine learning algorithms, even Google's TensorFlow, need CUDAs and NVIDIA specific drivers to use the GPU. SLI does not do anything for us. Multiple GPUs can be used to split up data sets and run them in parallel, but it's tricky as hell with neural networks. With multiple cards, it's better for us to run one algorithm on one card and another algo on the next card. Even Google created their own version of a GPU for deep learning that can be farmed much better than any NVIDIA option. So that's what it's meant for, but we are going to be testing it with gaming because again, people will be buying it for gaming uh, whether or not that's the best thing they should be doing. Just to clear up a few things, there is GeForce GTX branding on this card. In the initial renders of the Titan XP, that branding was not present. They were 3D renders, so they were not the actual product. The fact that it appears on this card doesn't really mean anything other than NVIDIA probably took the same tooling and applied it here once again. If we look under the hood, the card here, the Titan XP with the little p, uses a GP102-450 GPU, whereas the Titan X 2016 edition, the one we previously called Titan X capital P, that one uses GP102-400. So this is a rev higher, it's dash 450. And if that's not enough for you to tell the difference, you could also look at the back of the card. The Titan XP lacks DVI ports, whereas the Titan X 2016 has a DVI out. So that, those are the two primary differences here, since the branding on the outside looks functionally the same, actually in every aspect. For the full specs on the card, you can check the article linked in the description below, which contains the review and all the benchmarks that you'll see here, along with some extras. The Titan XP, again, $1,200 card. It's about $500 ahead of MSRP for the 1080 Ti reference card. And uh, other than that, there, that's, I mean, that's really all there is. There will be no add-on board partner models of the Titan XP. The one you see here is our modded version. It does not come with a liquid cooler. It comes with a normal FE cooler and uh, it's Nvidia only. You can only buy it from nvidia.com. Getting into the benchmarks, we'll put the OC stepping table on the screen now, since we're gonna be referencing that as we go through some of the overclocked benchmark numbers. The hybrid mod will come shortly hereafter and will probably contain a bit higher clocks just because it is liquid cooled. For full methodology and testing procedures, check the link below for the article in the description. Looking at total system power draw at the wall with 3D Mark Fire Strike Extreme, the Titan XP system draws around the same power as the 1080 Ti SC2 card from EVGA when both are stock. Each system draws around 345 watts. Overclocking the Titan XP gets it to around 400 watts total system power draw for an increase of about 15% over the stock card. The only configuration that draws more power than this is expectedly the Crossfire 580 plus 480 grouping at 460 watts, 
or about 16% more power draw than the TIXP. Looking at For Honor next, the Titan XP card stock configuration draws about 355 watts, about 10 watts behind the 1080 Ti SC2 AIB card with the boosted power budget on that PCB. Overclocked in the TIXP pushes its power draw to 375 watts total system power consumption for an increase of about 6% in this particular workload. Ghost Recon Wildlands posts total system power draw at around 370 375 watts for the stock SC2 and for the stock Titan XP cards. With an overclocked Titan XP, we see that jump to 424 watts total system power draw at the wall. That's an increase of about 13% power consumption from the overclock alone. Finally, idle power consumption for the full system is at about 75 watts for the TIXP system and about 73 watts for the 1080 Ti SC2 system. Given our less tight tolerances for power testing compared to other testing, this is effectively identical. Let's get into the most interesting aspect of this card, the thermals. Traditionally, the NVIDIA Founders Edition coolers have been the most limiting aspects of the cards. This can typically be compensated with higher fan RPMs at the cost of noise, but our hybrid models resolve both issues with one go, as do the AIB partner models, which won't be present for the TIXP. The Titan XP doesn't do too poorly here though. We're still hitting a thermal wall around 84C, with the fan stopping at around 55% fan speed from the default profile when under load, but clock fluctuations and fan fluctuations are shockingly steady with this card, but we're still losing at least 100 MHz off the clock as soon as thermals start rising. Our range is about 120 MHz, with the important point being that the clock remains steady after it's dropped that 100 MHz. That's good and bad. It's ideal for the clocks to remain stable, as we're seeing here for the most part, but it is less than ideal for them to drop as a result of thermals. That can be fixed by a better cooler. That keeps frame times more consistent in the least. Our hybrid mod will talk about this more and attempt to keep the higher clock speed maintained. Keep in mind that this is a power virus workload, so the clock does not enumerate in the same way that it would during a gaming workload. Clocks will therefore be lower here in looks, but we're just looking for stability, not max speed. Moving now to a thermal analysis chart, we're looking at component temperatures using thermocouples mounted to the MOSFETs and the VRAM components. We can compare against the 1080 Ti FE momentarily for a look at a nearby FE card. The Titan XP FET number 7 holds its temperature around 68 to 70 Celsius with its VRAM temperature around 80 C. This is pretty common for the VRAM temperature, though we haven't expanded that testing to the 1080 Ti FE just yet. GPU temperatures for the Titan XP are in the 84 C range, as you'd expect, which is roughly equal to the temperature of the 1080 Ti FE card. Let's get the FE temperatures on the screen now, just to expand this chart a bit. The temperatures are all roughly the same once we're under load, which makes sense. Seeing as the Titan XP is using a PCB that's basically a 1080 Ti FE PCB, the FE PCB, for what it's worth, was one that we praised fairly highly in our component level VRM analysis by Buildzoid, but again, it's about the same as we see on the Titan XP here. Fans ramp at exactly the same profile between the Ti XP and the 1080 Ti, if you are curious, as do temperatures and clocks, though the 1080 Ti runs a higher clock overall. The Ti GPU temperature is 1 to 2C higher in the beginning of the test, but the cards get closer over time. For noise testing, we're measuring at 20 inches away and doing so with a passively cooled system. The only component making noise in the system is the GPU. Fan speed at idle is the same for the Titan XP as for all other Founders Edition cards of this generation. We're running at around 23% idle fan speed with AIB partners demonstrating the noise floor with passive operation under idle conditions. The Titan XP maintains an output of about 31 dBA idle, which should be covered up by the case fans in most systems. Auto speeds land the Titan XP at 47.9 dBA when operating in the 55% fan speed range, compared to AIB Partner 1080 Ti cards in the 30s and 40s. This demonstrates the value of those AIB cards, but again, none will exist for the Titan XP. At 50% fan speed, we're looking at a noise output of around 44.9 dBA, with MSI and Gigabyte around the same noise levels, with EVGA a bit higher. You'd ideally never run a 100% fan speed on any of these GPUs, but we've included the numbers to demonstrate maximum noise possible anyway. Moving on to FPS benchmarks, we don't expect to see any extraordinary gains over the 1080 Ti cards, but we'll see if that $500 difference makes any impact in our gaming tests. Starting with Ghost Recon at Wildlands at 4K and very high settings, the NVIDIA Titan XP stock card performs at around 60 FPS average with lows at 52 and 48. 
This puts the card tied with the Overclocked 1080 Ti Gaming X and our own Overclocked Hybrid 1080 Ti FE mod, leading stock 1080 Ti cards by a couple percent. Versus the 1080 Ti FE reference card, we've got about an 8% gain from 55.3 to 60 FPS average over the AIB Partner 1080 Ti SC2 card that we just reviewed, configured stock, we see a percentage gain of about 2.2% average with frame times effectively equal. That means you're spending over $200 per percentage point gained in performance. Overclocking doesn't change much. The TI XP takes the lead at 65 FPS average, followed next by the 1080 Ti SC2 at 62 FPS average. The percentage difference here is 5%, so we're only paying $100 per percentage point once overclocking is permitted. At 1440p, the Titan XP performs identically in averages to the 1080 Ti SC2 card and close to the Gigabyte Extreme Aorus card. Both are priced at $720 and $750 respectively, currently anyway. The Titan XP falls slightly behind the 1080 Ti cards in frame times, though not in any meaningful way. However, this is a trend we see in a few other places later. Overclocking boosts the TI XP to 104 FPS average, though we run into thermal and power limits that threaten clock stability and therefore frame time performance. We're at 104 FPS average versus 99 average on the closest 1080 Ti OC card. That's about a 5% lead again, consistent with the 4K results. We see the same performance at 1080p with the Titan XP overclock faltering in frame time consistency in exchange for a 5% lead over the EVGA SC2 in averages. Mass Effect Andromeda at 4K positions the Titan XP at 68 FPS average, just behind the 1080 Ti Gaming X and ahead of the 1080 Ti SC2 from EVGA. These three cards are effectively equal in performance given standard deviation run to run and are completely equal with regard to user experience. At 1440p, the Titan XP ties again with the MSI 1080 Ti Gaming X and slightly leads the EVGA 1080 Ti SC2 cards all around 131 to 133 FPS average. Running Doom at 4K with Vulcan and Ultra settings, the Titan XP stock card runs around 94 FPS average ahead of the 1080 Ti reference card by about 5%. The Titan XP is effectively tied with the 1080 Ti reference card once the thermal constraint is removed as seen in our hybrid mod and falls behind the higher clock rates of all the other cards on the bench. Overclocking the Titan XP boost sit to 108 FPS average in this clock sensitive game, particularly benefiting from a big memory overclock. We gain about 3% over the 1080 Ti Extreme Aorus, and that's rounding up if we're being generous, leading to about a $160 cost per percentage point gained. Running for Honor at 4K, the Titan XP stock performs around 72 FPS average, tied with the Gaming X and averages, but behind marginally in lows, with 52 FPS 0.1 to 61 FPS 0.1% lows. 1080 Ti SC2 runs a 71 FPS average, tailing the Titan XP by 2.2% once again. Overclocking in this game proves problematic for nearly all devices we've tested, with stability becoming an issue without backing off the OC in substantial ways. Still, the TI XP manages to cling to the top spot just barely once overclocked, though it does falter again in lows. Sniper Elite 4 at 4K resolution with DX12 and Async Compute allowed our Crossfire RX 580 and 480 combo to outperform a reference 1080 Ti, thanks to fringe and multi-GPU optimization in this game. The Titan XP runs at 87 FPS average in this title, just ahead of the Gaming X at 86 FPS average, and just behind the overclocked 1080 Ti SC2 card. We've got a lead of about 14.9% over the reference 1080 Ti, or about 10.4% ahead of the Crossfire cards in this particularly well-optimized title. Overclocking gets us a reasonable lead of 11.5% over the SC2 overclocked card, bringing our cost per percentage point increase down to $40, since that's apparently a new metric that we need to use with this card. Clearly, this is not a good buy for gaming. Do not buy this card for gaming. You would be far better off if you need something high-end with a 1080 Ti, because you could buy either one of these two variants of the 1080 Ti. This one is 720 today, though that may go up, we've been told, and this one is 750. Either way, they're both going to for sure be 750 or below, and that is a savings of something like $450 over a $1,200 Ti XP, and the performance is roughly the same. It's like 2% in some cases different. And once you've overclocked it, these outperform until you overclock that, in which case it's maybe a 5% difference. For that much money, $100 per percentage point at 5%, not such a good deal. So we would not really recommend this for gaming. However, that doesn't mean it's a bad video card. Big difference, right? It's an okay card. It's just not okay for the price. So what this thing is meant for, it seems, we're not experts in neural networks, is stuff like what Grant does, the guy who loaned us the device. 
If you are doing something like Neural Net, look for a review where they specialize in that kind of thing. They can tell you if it's good for that application. Apparently the extra one gigabyte really helps in certain types of algorithms and workloads. For gaming, the extra one gigabyte of VRAM is totally irrelevant and the extra cores are clearly not giving us any kind of advantage over the really anything else we've got on the bench. So uh, that's it for the Titan XP review. Thank you, Grant, for loaning us this card. If you want to help us out directly, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help fund our in-depth testing. We have part two and three of this coming up very shortly for the hybrid mod. Results should be pretty interesting on that one. You go to store.gamersnexus.net to buy shirts like these and subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.